Big Mike here with my History of Comics, and today I'm talking X-Men. Why X-Men? Well, it was one of those formative superhero comics that I read when I was younger. Uh, It was the team book that I gravitated toward. What was it about X-Men that made me uh, into it more than I was into, say, Fantastic Four, Avengers, Teen Titans, or Justice League, any of the other big superhero teams? Part of it was the characters. I really responded to Wolverine, Nightcrawler, Colossus, etc. Um, More so than kind of the all-star team of the Justice League that would just go out and kind of do their job and fight bad guys. More so than the science fiction-tinged Fantastic Four that were, to be honest, stuck in a rut for most of the the, uh, years I was growing up. Teen Titans was almost all melodrama at the time. Uh, and the Avengers was kind of like the Justice League, but not as good, again, at the time. X-Men, though. Well, I got into the X-Men kind of in the prime of the series, albeit through reprints. In Essential X-Men 2, which I'll show you in a little bit, they reprint the formative stories, uh, including the Dark Phoenix saga. And it was uh, writer Chris Claremont and artist John Byrne, who kind of took the, the book to new heights in the late 70s and early 80s, And I was lucky enough to kind of just stumble upon that stuff before I came to the more modern books. So, this is just kind of a smattering of X-Men comics. Uh, I'm going to talk about each book or each individual comic individually. And kind of tell you what I like about them and why these, some of which are the most famous X-Men stories ever made, some of which are kind of off-the-beaten-path selections, are among my favorite comics. And here we have the Claremont Burn years in earnest. Uh, the art, very open, very clean. John Byrne could, at that time, set a scene. He could make a carry character look a little more scary by how he lit the face if he wanted to. You always knew who everyone was, where they were, what they were doing. It's a nice angle of Cyclops shooting down the hall at somebody while uh, Dazzler and Nightcrawler are advancing. Uh... Here's one of my favorite little panels. Nightcrawler is my favorite X-Man. Here's he here he is teleporting and knocking out three guys almost as one at once. And you can kind of see by the copious word balloons, Chris Claremont did not uh, let any opportunity to explain what the characters were doing, saying, or thinking to go um, unused. Believe it or not, uh, it's as kind of as much hand holding as that was. With a book with a cast as large as the X-Men, that was a kind of an uh, advantage. And the X-Men were kind of always undergoing some sort of tragedy, heightening the drama. Here's the days of future past. It's the future. The X-Men are being hunted down by Sentinels. Some of them are in concentration camps. Most of them are dead. Uh, Wolverine and Kitty Pryde are still alive, and they concoct a plan to go back in time. The recent film of the same name takes most of its plot from this particular comic although it it uses the scenario but adds its own spin to it again, you kind of have this irresistible cover, why are all these mutants, you know, in the original cover those little labels say slain or apprehended Uh, why are we seeing old Wolverine old Kitty, older Kitty Pride Why are all these mutants either dead or caught? What is going on here? Claremont and Byrne could really set a scene that would be instantly uh, catchy to a reader. What really sold me was the character moments. Uh, You could tell how each character related to each other, how they felt about each other. You know, Storm showing concern for Cyclops, who has to be the stoic leader guy as they get prepared to take down the love of his life, who is now this omnicidal maniac. I mean, it was exciting stuff, but the fact that you could get into the character's head, see what was going on with them, while at the same time, you had action, and kind of action that didn't really advance the plot much. Here's Colossus, Wolverine, and Nightcrawler, just working out in the danger room, training. You know, you'd get kind of sequences like this. Again, Chris Claremont, Fill it all up with word balloons. Not always the best strategy, but he could make it work. Tom Tom Orzhakowski, the uh, letterer, did a great job of kind of making his copious word balloons integrated into the art without covering up anything, I feel like. 
um, partly helped by the fact that John Byrne's backgrounds were somewhat sparse at times, which, again, not a complaint. So, again, it just grabbed me. You had the character stuff, you had the action stuff. It blended it well. Um, as a kid, there's 500 billion X-Men characters. You know, here alone you see Beast, Storm, Cyclops, Colossus, Wolverine, Nightcrawler. That's that's a, a mere handful. Even at the time, even when it came to the X-Men around 1990, that was only a small fraction of the characters that comprised the X-Universe. And as a kid, it's almost like what you see with Pokemon. you kind of got to catch them all. You want to know as much about this universe and these people as you can. Here's the introduction of Kitty Pride. The X-Men were good with viewpoint characters. She wasn't a part of the team. She, We readers kind of came to the team through her eyes once she was introduced. So even characters that were familiar ended up being uh, kind of amazing again. You know, she'd marvel at Storm using her powers, grow a little bit scared uh, at Nightcrawler's appearance. She wasn't sure what to make of Wolverine. Uh, and, you know, we as readers who might be familiar with these characters already, saw things her way, and it made us look at these familiar characters with a fresh set of eyes. So, again, here's kind of the soap opera aspect. She is a teenager. She doesn't know what's happening to her as her um, powers manifest. The metaphor for puberty is pretty obvious. Metaphor uh, was kind of a big thing with X-Men, as we'll see in the next selection I show you. Uh, in particular, mutants were hated and feared in the Marvel Universe, so it could stand for any kind of prejudice you want, and you're put on the side of the underdogs. You know, Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor, the Avengers, uh, they're heroes, but they're not underdogs. They're already out there as beloved public figures, um, whereas the X-Men were hated and feared and, you know, as a teenager, you can kind of relate to that. You, you, you're not sure what's going on with your life yourself. Everything's very dramatic. Everything's heightened. Uh, the X-Men reflected that, especially under Claremont, more so than any other superhero team, until they all started kind of copying the X-Men uh, and making the angst uh, the main emotion right at the forefront. Uh, Marv Wolfman and George Paris did a great job making New Teen Titans an amazing comic, but, again, it was kind of in the X-Men mold, and soon, like I said, Batman and the Outsiders, all sorts of other super team books would come along that would be not exactly X-Men clones, but using the X-Men formula. One of the seminal uh, X-Men stories, God Loves, Man Kills. you got to love that melodramatic title. The enemy here wasn't, you know, the typical supervillains they'd face. Magneto, although he was far from the typical supervillain. The Juggernaut, the Sentinels, um, the Hellfire Club, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, any of that. It was a guy with a crusade, a regular human who wanted to stamp out the mutants uh, through multiple means, but partially through fanning the flames of prejudice. So the X-Men were behind the eight ball again, not just because they had to fight, but because they had to um, win over the public as much as they can, which is kind of an uphill battle for them. An iconic panel in which the main villain, William Stryker, also the main villain, villain of the film X2, X-Men United, uh, human, you dare call that thing human? You know, looks to Nightcrawler, the least human-looking member of the team, and kind of tries to use him to, again, fan the fa fan the flames of fear in the people watching. And it's kind of easy to do that when you're seeing something not as a human first, but judging by its appearance, judging by his demeanor, um, which, again, as a teenager... As a as an adolescent, you can kind of relate to that. It's like, look under the skin. See the real me, everybody. Not this uh, surface that is easy to judge, even though, again, as teenagers, we'd kind of decorate our surface however we wanted in an effort to reflect the real us. Um, which, again, you can kind of relate to superhero costumes with their symbolism. Less so in X-Men, but, you know... Uh, Batman wants to look scary, so he dresses scary. Superman wants is dressed in bright primary colors. Um, 
to show how how open and and um positive he is kind of I'm kind of losing my point but basically you know as a teenager you could kind of relate to superheroes in general but with the X-Men's added underdog status and the fact that people all around them thought they were this these weird alien things and you know as a teenager everybody thought well no one can understand me uh that aspect of the X-Men really hit home course you could just use the x-men for a rousing fun story too this is one of the earliest marvel trades x-men the asgardian wars i believe it was collected in trade paperback in the 80s mostly because the artist was art adams um a one of my favorite artists who d- put a lot of detail into his work and was kind of the forerunner of a lot of the artists who would later work for image like jim lee rob liefeld todd mcfarlane Although, to be fair, I think Art Adams was far more talented and um, had a better work ethic than a lot of the those guys. You know, not all of them, but a lot of them. But if you look at kind of his tendency to put lots of lines into things and distort things anatomically, you can see the future of the artists who would um, gain greater popularity at Marvel and then form their own companies right there. Uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of young artists at the time looked at these this type of material and thought, ooh, ooh, I want to do that. Also, this book uh, showed the X-Men could kind of fit in with other times and places. Here is Loki, main villain of the X... Uh, excuse me, main villain of the Avengers film, turning Storm into a sort of a goddess. Um, seeing Loki interact with the X-Men and the other one of the spin-off teams, the New Mutants, was quite novel at the time. Even still, they haven't really uh, had too many crossovers between the two, although there have been a few notable ones. And it was kind of cool to see the X-Men interacting in the Marvel Universe uh, beyond their own little sphere, which, unlike most of the other superheroes at Marvel, they didn't really participate in too directly... In most of the crossovers, there there was the occasional guest appearance by Spider-Man or Spider-Woman or the Avengers or whomever, but those were few and far between. Mostly the X-Men was a story in and of itself. It was a team that was kind of isolated from the larger goings-on at Mar. And by the way, here's Storm, Goddess of Thunder. Uh, that's just a cool shot. I've always liked that. Incidentally, the X-Men featured more women than most super teams. And Chris Claremont seemed to pay more attention to the woman characters. Uh, Oh, incidentally, he wrote the book from the mid-70s to the very early 90s and shaped a lot of what everybody did after that. But in the 80s, when this book was published, they went from a team with one or two women to a team that, let's see, Storm, Rogue, Rachel Summers, Kitty Pryde, Dazzler, Psylocke, um, and on the men, Nightcrawler and Colossus were eventually written out. Colossus was written back in. But you had Wolverine, Havoc, who was kind of a weak-willed guy, and Longshot, who was kind of a joke character in a lot of ways. I really liked Longshot, but he wasn't um, taken nearly as seriously as most of the other members of the cast. The women tended to dominate, uh, which was very unique in superhero comics, and unfortunately remains unique today. And that's it for part one of why I became an X-Men fan. Uh, In part two, I'll look at one of my favorite artists, Paul Smith, as well as some of the kind of off-the-beaten track uh, X-Men issues that I like, and talk a little bit about Grant Morrison's run, too. Thanks for watching.